Thank you very much, Katia, and thank you, Natalia, for the invitation to come along and uh, share some ideas uh, with you young people of Google. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, I have been around a long time. I've written a lot of things. As Katia said, I actually wrote textbooks. I did that for the money, by the way. Uh, but there's another Google fact that um, I don't usually put on my uh, CV either, since that I started out writing poetry, but I gave it up. And then when people in afterwards, after years, would ask me, like, I'd love to see some of your poetry. And I said, no, you can't see it. <laughs> so I've been writing prose, um, short stories, novels, plays, you name it. And um, I want, this is my latest book. And a kind of a lifetime of experience has gone into it, even though it didn't take a lifetime to write it. But um, the first story in it was one of the first stories I ever wrote, and I think it was probably around 69 when I wrote it. It was published, I think, in 70 or thereabouts. So that's a long time ago. And I've included it in this as the first story. <clears throat> the other ones were written recently, but um, the ideas that are in the book have evolved <clears throat> through a lifetime of thinking, working, etc. So I'll give you a short uh, talk first and then I'll read one of the stories and then if you have questions and that you can you can put them to me. So um, I want to concentrate on organization and institution because these are two ideas <clears throat> that I've been playing around with and trying to come to terms with and analyze for a while now and very much so in this particular book. To me, the most potent word in the English language is organize. Once upon a time, it was the slogan, the call to action of the political left. But for political or social action of any kind, it was also the first challenge. There was little point in mourning or complaining. If you wanted to change the way things were done, you had to organize. It meant getting together like-minded people who felt strongly about some issue, strongly enough to dedicate time and energy to the cause. It is self-evident that this is how improvement of the human condition has been affected since humans began to live in communities, organize, go beyond the individual, families, extended families, tribes, political groups, religious communities, nations, states, international bodies. I have been around a long time and have done more organizing than most, and the world is more organized now than it has ever been before. So, am I happy? Well, no, I'm not happy. I am now extremely conscious of a negative outcome of organization a phenomenon that I recognize as a hindrance to further progress. I call it institution. The opposition of organization and institution needs to be understood and addressed. Let's take it from first principles. A group of people come together to achieve something. They recruit supporters, garner resources, become powerful. Say they achieve their aim in due course. So what do they do then? Fold their tents and go home, disband, dispose of the assets in an appropriate way? Not likely. Now you have an organization that has power, resources, and people in charge who like being in charge. Even though they have achieved the purpose they set out to achieve, or have abandoned it as the case may be, they continue operating, inventing new purposes, but with one overriding purpose, self-perpetuation. This transition I define as going from organization to institution. An institution is an organization that has passed its use-by date. Most political parties are probably good examples of this. Because the purpose of the institution now is to serve those in charge rather than the original cause, it adopts a very different outlook. The emphasis is on unquestioning loyalty to the leadership to the institution. Critical thinking is discouraged. Dissent is akin to treachery. So the organization 
in becoming an institution is an impediment to progress rather than an agent of progress. We see today that the state, which should be the absolute manifestation of democracy, has been turned into an institution. And within it, we see institutionalized behavior everywhere. It is particularly evident in the response when citizens are abused, whether by the civil service, the police, the health service, wherever. Circle the wagons, admit nothing, don't apologize, stand by your colleagues. The state is merely a service provider and the citizen merely, merely a client, just a client and not a member of the community of which the state is the physical manifestation. My book, Rehabilitating the Serpent, tries to analyse and understand and come to terms with this phenomenon. The organisation becoming institutionalised, becoming a barrier to the achievement of the very goal that inspired the original organisers. I have taken the area of religion to examine and analyse because one would expect that this would be the last place where the institution would take precedence over the central spiritual mission. But we know from bitter experience that the preservation of the institution, even preservation from embarrassment, is the central concern. But I want to emphasize that what I illustrate in relation to religion holds good for all areas of human activity. I pick religion because it sets out with the loftiest ambitions and falls to the lowest depths. You may be wondering what would he know about organisations and institutions, a writer who has probably spent his life isolated in an attic room. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I was born in a remote corner of County Sligo, where until then life had changed little for generations. My father was a blacksmith with nine children to support. When tractors replaced horses on the farms, his trade and skills became redundant. And like so many more, our family became economic migrants. Similar families went to England, America or other English-speaking countries, but we just travelled to the Midlands of Ireland, where Bornemona was developing an industry around the harvesting of peat for fuel. During the summer, there was even work for children, footing or harvesting turf. And this was where I earned my first pay packets. But within a few years, the company had developed machines to do this job, and our manual skills were redundant. I came to Dublin with a scholarship to go to university, but the money was not adequate. And instead, I worked at different jobs, including time in a laboratory, five years in the civil service, etc. But I did manage to pick up a degree by entering examinations. Then I went teaching and ended my employed life as a school principal. So I probably have some experience at organizing. I was always leftist by inclination. And while I was a teacher, I was active in the Teachers Union of Ireland, serving as chairman of the County Dublin branch for two years. Alongside all of this, of course, I was writing. I was I published poems while I was still in secondary school, then turned to short stories, and in later years to novels and plays. Dublin was renowned as a literary city, always. So when I arrived here in the 60s, I was expecting to find a vibrant community of writers, lots of literary events, and an atmosphere nurturing and inspiring to young writers. Alas, I was disappointed. The only literary institutions were the so-called literary pubs, and these were people by small cliques that jealously guarded their membership and their sphere of influence. There was no welcome for working class young men or women. I never found any of the cliques particularly attractive anyway. So with other similarly minded people of my own generation, we began to do things in an alternative way publishing our own literary magazines, organizing our own pub readings. One such series of readings with music ran for a full year, every, night, uh, every Tuesday night in 1975. Then we published books, mostly poetry. It was difficult, but we had reasonable success, and we were making inroads into the literary scene in our own way. 
The more I got to know writers, the more I realized that each one was trapped in a personal world and that they found it difficult to make common cause with others similarly trapped. The very nature of writing tends to generate this phenomenon. It is largely a solitary activity, extremely personal, like giving birth. And when the work is delivered, it is like a child in which the author has invested his ambitions and dreams and personality, and which he now jealously oversees with anxiety and with partisan devotion. As a trade unionist, I could see that writers were ideal for exploitation, divide and rule, that they were already divided, so it was only too easy to exploit them, and exploited they were. Often they were not paid for their work. They surrendered their rights in a, in a book to publishers with little reward, without even considering the consequences. And the state had no qualms about marketing the country as a tourist destination on the back of all the writers who brought distinction to it. At the same time, the state expected writers to be humbly grateful if they threw a few crumbs to them by way of so-called funding for the arts. I could see all of this and could not understand how writers had so little self-respect as a profession that they let this happen. There was almost no infrastructure for representing writers or for addressing their issues at the time. Writing was still regarded as the privileged occupation of a privileged few. I remember in the early 80s, Christina Murphy ran a groundbreaking series of educational articles in the Irish Times advising students on their career options. While every possible career was covered, and many impossible ones, writing was not given so much as a mention apart from journalism, an activity that generated countless millions of euro for the economy was not considered a profession. In 1983, I was appointed to a position as principal of a vocational school in Lucan to become Lucan Community College four years later. This opened up some opportunities for me. Up until then, there were no workshops for aspiring writers as we know them now. So on one night a week in my school, I mounted a programme of work workshops to cater for a whole range of genres, fiction, poetry, drama, and in two languages. I employed established writers to conduct these workshops and so put money in their pockets, however little. The 80s were a time of high unemployment, emigration, cutbacks, austerity of every kind. The government brought in the first community employment scheme in order to take people off the live register. Schools were included among the bodies who could employ such people under the scheme. So I applied to employ personnel, including two writers, one to be a writer in residence in the school, the other to do research for me on the possibilities of writing as a feasible profession. It was approved, and for the first time in Ireland, we had someone recognised as being employed as a professional writer. So the first writer in residence was not in any of the universities, it was in Lucan Vocation School. With the man who was employed as a secretary, I began to assemble the names and addresses of as many writers as I could identify. And by the summer of 1986, we had about 100 names and addresses of the most prominent writers in the country. This was a greater feat than you people might realise. It was before personal computers, before the internet, before Google. What one could do in a few hours today with access to Google took us several months. Then to contact them, I had to duplicate a circular explaining what I was aiming to do and inviting them to join the trade union, the Irish Writers' Union. We sent out the circulars in a single tranche because I was afraid that if I did it piecemeal, one clique might associate the union with another clique and decide that they would never join an organisation that the others were in. So I was absolutely relieved and delighted when almost everyone immediately joined up. The organisation was clearly something whose time had come. Over the autumn of 1986, I held a series of meetings so that we had a fully established trade union by the 1st of January 1987. 
we immediately began to work on the issues that had been festering for generations, like writer's contract, payments for appearances at festivals, etc., etc., etc. Even censorship raised its head that year, and we had to deliver a coup de grace. During that year, 1987, a general election put Fianna Fáil into office with Charles Hawhey as Taoiseach. Hawhey had a genuine interest in the arts and kept the arts portfolio in his own department, appointing the writer Anthony Cronin as his advisor. As it happened, Anthony Cronin had joined the Irish Writers' Union. After a couple of weeks when I had judged that they had settled into their seats, I phoned Anthony Cronin. His immediate response was, Jack, I know what you're looking for, money. But the word is here that there is money for absolutely nothing. I replied, no, Tony, I'm not looking for money, but I have an idea I want to run past you. You're sure you won't be looking for money? I won't. So he met me, and I explained. In earlier times, the government had bought up many old Georgian houses in the centre of Dublin as offices for an expanding civil service. Now, during the 80s recession, the civil service was shrinking again. Many of the buildings had been vacated, and the state could not afford even the cost of their upkeep. Neither could they sell them because no one wanted to buy. I want one of those buildings for a writer's centre. I gave him an outline of what such a centre could be and what it would facilitate. A base for organisations, a venue for events, a drop-in centre for writers, an information hub, a facility for workshops and professional development. It took five, maybe ten minutes, and then he turned to me. He said, you know, that's a great idea. Leave it with me, I'll see what I can do. Within two weeks, he phoned me back. You're on, he said. I got approval for that idea. Later that same year, the government launched the National Lottery. I submitted a case for funding for the Irish Writers' Centre and received a grant of £100,000. A building and a grant. It was a start. Of course, we ended up in 19 Parnell Square, but that's a long story. We'd be here until tomorrow to, if, we went through, <laughs> if we went through all the, the, the uh, twists and turns of the story. Meanwhile, the work of the union had to be kept underway. Negotiations with other literary organisations led to the playwrights and translators participating in the proposed new writer centre. Negotiations with publishers, the publishers organisation set in motion a project to establish a copyright agency. By the time the writer centre opened in 19, 1991, we had one of the best organised literary sectors in Europe, having started out four years earlier with the worst. The key to our success lay in organisation. I have always been conscious of the way organisations can, can become fossilised and the consequent need for turnover of personnel. Originally, I had hoped to achieve all I set out to achieve in two years and then bow out, but it took me five years. Then I retired totally from the scene and left it to others to continue the work and make their own unique contribution without having me looking over their shoulders. But in 2009, I was thrust back into the midst of it again. The first cutbacks of the new recession hit the arts community with vicious intent, and the grant to the Writers' Centre was withdrawn entirely. Up until then, the Writers' Centre had been receiving a generous grant. However, it was the assessment of the Arts Council that it was not delivering value for money in terms of services to writers. I think any fair-minded observer at the time would not have contested that assessment. Over some years, the centre had become complacent and eventually become what I call an institution. The original drive to serve the writing community had been lost, and now the centre served merely the interests of the people involved. But they felt secure. After all, this was the Irish Writers' Centre, too important to be dumped but dumped it was. The staff were made redundant. Most of the board fled lest they be contaminated by association with this failed entity. Only the building remained and three brave board members. 
It was clear that the Arts Council had ruthlessly decided that the centre would close. The stalwart three invited me to rejoin and four made a quorum for business purposes. We stabilised our relations with the bank and other stakeholders, maintaining confidence that we could survive despite the odds. Then the debate started as to how. The establishment advisers who came along claims that we could survive only if the Arts Council restored the grant. I proposed that we had to start from the beginning again, turn the board into an executive committee and recruit people who were prepared to contribute some time and work. We had to organise. This horrified the establishment advisers who clarified that the official guidelines of the Arts Council demanded boards to govern not to be involved in the running of the body in question. But we had nothing to govern. My three colleagues had just a short tenure left on the board, so I took over as chairman. There was an atmosphere of doom in the country that year because of the recession. There were no jobs for the generation of graduates who left college. I felt that some of these young people would prefer to be working for nothing than hanging around Starbucks. So I recruited a team of volunteers to unpaid but full-time jobs running the centre. The success of the project is manifest in the fact that the Writers' Centre not only survived but has been thriving ever since, embarking on new areas of activity all the time. It is not just a place, it is a vibrant organisation. Having served my four years this time on the board, I stood back again in 2012. As I mentioned, my book, Rehabilitating the Serpent, tackles this phenomenon of organisations becoming institutions, often with values that are in direct contravention of those of the originators. And it is probably most evident in the case of religion. All religions begin in an imaginative effort to interpret this very confusing existence of ours and to suggest ways in which life can be improved but as soon as an idea gains traction, <coughs> sorry. As soon as an idea gains traction, as soon as an organisation gains con gains ground, certain people take over all of a type. They see the opportunity of gaining power over other people, ma manipulating them, and exploiting them for their own ends. They take control of the organisation and turn it into an institution with a central purpose, self-perpetuation, self-serving. It happens in most revolutions. It happened to Marxism as well as to the major religions. When I was growing up, the expectation was that in the scientific age, religions would become less influential, would be relegated to private practice in a secular world. No one would have anticipated that the inherent attractions of religion would still be used as instruments of hate and murder by power mongers in the 21st century. I am a writer, a storyteller, and when I have something important to say or an insight I want to communicate, I must do it through story. And so I want to read you a story from Rehabilitating the Serpent, in which I oppose the end point of religion with its starting point in the hope that people will recognize that institutional, institutionalizing religion is an utter travesty and destroys the very thing it is meant to nurture. It is called the silent one. <coughs> no, wrong book. Important that your page is marked. <clears throat> so this is called the silent one. <clears throat> All day they have been streaming into my wilderness, assaulting my peace with their noise and their questions. I bolted my door and refused entry to the clamoring hordes with their waving microphones and their sparking cameras. When the mayor of my local town appeared at the window, I relented and opened the door momentarily to let him slip through. 
I visited the town once a month or so to barter goods, so I was familiar with them. I had always done my best to sustain a non-hostile relationship with the townspeople. The mayor was almost breathless. He explained that the silent one had been captured and summarily executed. During his brief interrogation, he had remained true to his name and said nothing. Then, as they raised their guns, he said, Ask Johnny to tell you what happened in the camp. Johnny is not my real name. It is a label of convenience in the global language, a word that has provided anonymity, but the silent one, let us call him Peter in the global language, would have given my name in our native language. Otherwise, they would never have identified me, or it would have taken them longer than a week to track me down. Anyway, Peter would hardly have known the name I had adopted in the global language. The Silent One, a name that had transmitted fear across much of the world. In our holy wars, he was the absolute holy warrior. He slaughtered and slaughtered and slaughtered. But never once did he proclaim his faith. Never once did he, like the others, offer up his deeds to the God he served. Hence his name, the Silent One. They did not understand him, so they feared him all the more. No wonder they dispatched him with such urgency. It might appear like a label of convenience concocted by the media to give immediate identification and concrete form in, to the shadowy terror he represented for them and that they loved to embellish for their audience. But he had always been the silent one. The mayor explained that the media were pouring in from all around the world. They were prepared to pay any fees I quoted for my story. A stage was being assembled right outside my hut, especially for my interview. It would be ready for nine o'clock. That was prime time for broadcasting a new story. And the sun would be gone down, so the stage would look splendid under lights. Everything would be crisp and clear for the watching world. And he had assured the media people of my adequate command of the global language. That was more or less what he said, and I let him slip out again. He had to get ready. No doubt he would dress in his finest, hoping for an appearance on the stage at nine, a prelude to a breakthrough into major league politics. All day long, the big trucks kept arriving, their satellite dishes posturing self-importantly over the cabs. Other trucks brought tons of scaffolding and lights and electricity generators. They were assembling the stage at an incredible rate, and I had to marvel at their arrogance, their presumption, their unquestioning sense of entitlement. What happened in the camp? How long ago was it? 20 years? More? But it felt like 200 years ago. It seemed as if it had happened to others in another world or in a particularly nasty nightmare. The passage of time had not dulled the memory, but had petrified the experience. It lodged in the soul like a granite sculpture, precise in every detail, immutable. Yet, I no longer engaged with it in a condition of trauma. We were children then, confined to the camp. Our parents were dead or missing in the latest outbreak of the Holy Wars. Peter was, of course, referring to what happened to Lucy. Lucy was not her name in our native language, but the name in the global language that best represents her for me, because her image always evokes light. She radiated light, attracted light. She simply was light. She was a little older than me, not much older, perhaps a year or two. Peter was a year or two younger again. That is an age gap among children. And we looked up to her as if she were already an adult. To me, she was the most beautiful creature in the world. One day we were gathered in a corner of the compound where the barbed wire fence segregated our beaten earth with the pastured countryside beyond. We were particularly downcast in spirit and one little girl complained, how can God let so many bad things happen? 
Similar thoughts had no doubt wandered through the mind of the rest of us, though we were wary of articulating them. So we deflected the question towards Lucy, who seemed to have read all the books in the library before they burned it down. There was only one explanation, said Lucy. God is dead. They have killed God. Every one of us was shocked and even more downcast at this news. If God was dead, and we had every reason to believe Lucy, who then would come to rescue us? She must have seen the despair in our faces because she immediately lifted her voice. Listen, she said, and our heads bunched into a huddle with hers. I read that there is a people somewhere who believe that God sang the world into existence. Isn't it lovely to think that? Imagine God waking up one morning in good humour, beginning to hum. As he hums, he creates the air, and there is a fresh breeze to cool his face. So he hums louder and creates the sea. The wind and the sea begin to play with one another, and God is so happy that he hums the land into existence and gives them a beach to play on. At this stage, God is excited, and he breaks into song. He sings the sun and the moon and the stars into life. His song rises and he creates the thunder clouds and the rain. His voice softens and he creates the flowers and the insects, the birds and the animals. By the time he takes a rest, we, he finds that he has created a whole world. Sitting back, admiring his creation, he thinks that it would be good to have creatures who would appreciate how wonderful this world is that he had created. So one final time he sang and brought human beings into life. He showed them his beautiful creation and asked them to mind it for him, to sustain it by singing. That is a lovely God, said one of the younger children, and now they have killed him. Lucy was quick to detect the new surge of despondency. Yes, they have, she said, but what if we can sing God back to life? the way he sang the world into existence? What if there is a little spark of him left somewhere and we can fan it to life with our voices? How can we do such a thing? We're not very good singer and we do not have any songs. We can do our best, said Lucy, and we do have songs. She started humming one of our skipping rhymes, then twisted the words cleverly to mean that she was bringing God back to life followed by a litany of beautiful names for the God she was resuscitating. All of this was in our native language, of course, so there was no point in my trying to recall the words. But everyone knows street rhymes, even those anemic ones in the global language. We all joined in skipping to this incantation, and it lifted our spirits. Then Lucy took another rhyme we used for a street game, a game that was more difficult to play on the caked earth of the camp as it involved hopping on one foot while kicking a stone to a target spot with that standing foot. This rhyme she shaped into a prayer that the reborn God would come and rescue us and reunite us with our families. Every day Lucy had adapted another rhyme for the purpose of singing God back to life. We rapidly learned each rhyme and chanted it with enthusiasm and a growing confidence in our endeavor. Then one day, a man was passing and paused to listen. Peter was nearest to him, so he asked what the curious rhymes were that we were chanting. Peter enthusiastically replied that God was dead, but that we were going to sing him back to life. The man inquired whose idea that was, and Peter proudly declared that Lucy had composed the songs for us. The man, like all the men in the camp, gloried in being a fighter for the cause of religion. He was clearly horrified by what he heard. He grabbed Lucy by her long hair and dragged her with him, cursing her with words like whore and slut. I followed at a distance. He dragged her into a house of one of the elders. Within a short time I could see men arriving and understood that it was a hastily assembled tribunal. When they were all inside, I went to the door and listened. They were accusing her of blasphemy, of being an agent of the devil, and calling her all sorts of nasty names. All of them agreed that this illustrated the mistake of teaching girls to read and allowing them access to books. 
they lauded the wisdom of burning down the library, and they condemned her to be burned to death in the square the next morning. I followed wherever they brought her. After the sun went down, they dragged her to a tent in the quarter where the fighters were billeted. Surely they wouldn't do anything to a child, I thought, but I feared the worst. Although still a child, Lucy was on the threshold of work womanhood, and I remember the way the men glanced at her with a mixture of lust and loathing in their eyes. I heard Lucy screaming and moaning in pain, and imagined the unspeakable things they were doing to her in the tent. A queue formed, and the men took turns going inside, as if they were using the latrine. After a while, I heard no more screams or moans from Lucy. I sat on a low wall outside the tent. The fighters ordered me off several times, but I didn't budge. One of them threw a stone at me, and even though it hit me hard on the shoulder, I didn't wince. Eventually, they left me alone. I was determined to stay as close as possible to Lucy, so that she might sense my presence, however unlikely that might be. All night I kept vigil while that obscene queue of holy warriors snaked its way to the door of the tent. As soon as the first ray of sunlight glinted on the horizon, they dispersed, as if their deeds would not bear the scrutiny of daylight. I continued my vigil until two fighters emerged, dragging Lucy's already half-dead body between them to the central square where they chained her to the granite column. I sat on the ground in front of her, so battered, so mutilated, she was barely conscious. Just then, I was aware of someone else at my shoulder and turned to see Peter. The expression of absolute despair, absolute suffering on his face was terrible to witness. I put my arm around his shoulder to assure him that he was not responsible for this savagery. I said something to Lucy to catch her attention, to alert her to our presence, but she did not reply, but focused her eyes on me. I said something else. She raised her hand to her mouth and with two fingers, miming a scissors, she indicated that they had cut out her tongue. Then she waved her head to indicate that we should go, lest we should witness the final horror. Again, I didn't move, determined to face whatever horror they were going to inflict and to share it in so far as I could. When Lucy saw that we were determined to stay, she became calm. She even broke into a smile. At first, I thought it was at us she was smiling. Then she nodded her head to direct my gaze. At the other end of the square, the traders were beginning to set up their stalls. A van was delivering milk and bread to a shop. Children were squatting on a doorstep. She nodded again to show I had not detected what she was trying to indicate. Then I spotted it. At the base of an abutment, squeezing out of a crevice, was a flower, newly blossomed. I remember that it was yellow, but no more than a weed, the kind that grows defiantly on any wasteland. When she saw that I had spotted it, she smiled again. She obviously saw some significance in it because she kept her eyes fixed on it while the men arrived with a can of petrol, doused her and set her alight. It was a horrible sight to witness, but I did not take my eyes off Lucy until she was dead. In so far as I know, neither did Peter. A couple of years later, an attack on our camp was imminent and we all scattered. Once I was outside and on the road, I kept travelling scavenging for survival. I had travelled a great distance from the camp when I came upon this shack, obviously abandoned in an earlier campaign of the Holy Wars. I settled here and here I am still, in this hut in a forsaken wilderness. Peter joined a band of fighters, on a random choice it would appear, and he became the most feared fighter of all in the recent campaigns of the Holy War. He was renowned as the Silent One. Unlike the others who were always boasting their religious allegiance, bragging of their great deeds, beseeching God to favour them in battle, the Silent One said nothing. He just slaughtered as many of the opposing warriors as he could. Now, 
they have assembled this magnificent stage right here in my wilderness. The world has come to my door. They expect me to give voice to the silent one. The mayor has arrived, prancing around like a peacock, as he obsequiously ushers me to the bank of microphones and the battery of cameras, I am blinded by the lights, but nevertheless notice that the backdrop is peppered with sponsors' logos. This is clearly major entertainment. The war is the world's entertainment, more chilling than the nightly fictions they watch, because it is real. They have not come to inquire, to learn, to understand. They have come merely for the story. Nine o'clock, and they tell me the world is watching, waiting. They ask questions, barrage me with questions about the camp. But my mind has wandered back to the flower that Lucy watched so intensely as they doused her with Petra. Did she see it as a message from her God? A message that, no matter how rampant was the ugliness and hatred, Beauty and love would triumph regardless. Was that why she was smiling? I want to go back to my hut to close the door and to think about this, so I get up to leave. They are going frantic with their questions and their frustration. But I'm getting impatient too and annoyed with them. I took none of their money. I owe them no explanation. Not as much as a word. Do they not understand? that I too was called the Silent One. All of us who were children then were dubbed the Silent Ones. Thank you, Jack. And I think we'll all need a minute or a second to absorb that. I think that's been a very powerful, emotional, and a masterful journey in just a few pages. And um, I think we're going to open our Q&A session. And um, should we grab a chair? What yeah, do you yeah, think? Yeah. Shall we? Uh, so the plan is that I'll ask a couple of questions. But please prepare yours if you have any. I'll invite you uh, to ask a couple. And just to transition from the story that you read out to us, um, as I said, it is when I read it myself first time when I was preparing for the meeting, I was surprised how emotional, how dramatic of a story you could tell in just a few pages. Literally, you took me on an emotional roller coaster in a space of, I don't know, 3,000 words, 5,000 words at max. So, can you tell us a bit more why short story? is such a powerful format, and why is it so popular in Ireland? Um, yeah, I, I do think that the short story is a very, very powerful uh, literary form. <clears throat> I started out writing poems, but as I said, I don't admit to it anymore, and certainly don't show anybody any poems I wrote. But once I started writing short stories, I realized that the short story is very, very close to the poem, that it can be just as powerful in terms of emotional intensity and it can have the same kind of impact. And the fact that it's narrative, I think, you know, allows for greater scope than the actual poem. So once I fell in love with the short story, I was probably early 20s, I, I never went back and thought that the short story was <coughs> the literary form. I still am very much enamoured with it and still obviously write a, a few poems. But since in recent years I have written novels and uh, plays and things as well, you know, so. so but, what, uh, but what's your favourite? Is it a so short story still? Um, probably, yeah. But as I say, I don't, I've It's not a trick question. I don't mean to. novels and a novella and five or six plays. And I'm kind of started on another novel. So I'm not concentrating on short stories because it is a, it's a, there's a problem with the short story and it's similar to poems that not many people read them. So you don't really 
have much of a chance of making an impact on people if you write poems or short stories. People talk a lot of baloney about poems and poets. Well, in fact, nobody reads poetry. Nobody listens to poets, um, except very, very tiny uh, following. Uh, it's almost similar with the short story. It's a small following, very dedicated following. And the problem is that the short story demands something of the reader, that the reader has to respond and uh, invest some thought in this creative thing called the story. So the story is not something that the writer writes and the uh, reader receives, uh, end of story. It's a kind of, there's a, there's a process which involves both, and the reader can kind of become emotionally involved, intellectually involved, and can use their own imagination to develop aspects of this particular story. You know? So it's, um, it has tremendous potential, but because it's demanding, it's not the kind of thing that you take up on the news and have read by the time you get home. That doesn't really work. And that's why everybody on the news is listening to their favorite songs rather than reading short stories. It demands work, and uh, so you have a small following, you know. Well, I feel like, as a Googler, we can relate to the discussion about the short versus long ter uh, copy. Those who are, of you who work in YouTube, you're probably well aware of that. Um, so what creative works. So in the literary terms, that's a conversation about the short story versus the novel. Um, and Jack has mentioned that um, it's such a niche group of people who actually read short story. So Jack, would you be able to maybe describe who is your reader? Do you know, is it a woman? Is it a man? Is it an older person? Is it a younger person? What's the target audience, if I may? Uh, well, as I said, the short story, like the poem, requires somebody who's particularly mm -hmm. dedicated, somebody who's prepared to apply their minds and their imaginations to the reading of the short story and the receiving of it and you know so it could be old young could be anybody you know I had a wonderful experience with this particular book um, <clears throat> I um, uh, had the, my plumber in a few weeks ago and you know he's also a very good friend and when he's finished plumbing we always sit down and have a coffee and chat and you know usually takes <laughs> takes an hour of his time which he doesn't pay he doesn't charge me for but anyway we were talking recently and uh, he said uh, what are you doing these days any other books and I said oh yeah another book out. And it was there so I said there you are there's a present so he took it away and he says I don't read books you know he, he rang me up about two weeks later and he says do you know what he says I never read books but I started reading your book last weekend and I couldn't leave it down <laughs> and he says, I, uh, I enjoyed it so much. And then he started going through it. And he had literally analyzed it and knew it from beginning to end. Now, I would never have imagined him as my target audience. <laughs> okay. uh, lovely fella and that. But um, it turned out that, you know, yes, he, he, he was a wonderful reader. And he came back from his holidays. I got a text from him yesterday. And he sent me a photograph of trees. He says, these reminded me of your first story, <laughs> where somewhere, I forget where in the, in the world, Spain or somewhere, they had these ornamental trees where they put them into a brace to shape them in different ways, you know? And my first story is about people who um, uh, take over the country and convert everybody into uh, dwarfs because, you know, they want, they think that the dwarf form is the perfect form, you know? Anyway. I encourage everyone to read that story. I've, it, it is in your book, and I've read it. And again, it is powerful. And because it's so short, I feel like it's uh, so powerful. Um, well, uh, another question. So we are, I'm going to ask you something a bit more personal and uh, less literature related. How does a working day of a writer look like? <laughs> You'd have to ask every individual writer in the country because everybody is different. <clears throat> Some people, you know, they're lucky or whatever. 
and they get up in the morning and they sit down at their desk and they work for four hours and then have their lunch and then another four hours and then they have their dinner and they relax. You know, not many people do that. Most writers have to work for the living, you know, so you'll find that there are lots of people in Google who are writers, okay? Um, so their working day is they work in Google until what time? Nine at night. <laughs> and then they go home and at midnight they start writing and between midnight and 2 a.m. they produce their work. So that's the two extremes and everybody else is in between. I'm not an organized kind of person. I write whenever the pressure is on me to get something written. You know? I think we can <laughs> all relate to that. The power of deadlines uh, does wonders, right? Doesn't it? Which brings me, that's uh, interesting that you've mentioned about the, our own writers that we have at Google, and I'm sure we do, many of those. Um, I have the following question. So, as I've read through your bio, I couldn't help but notice that become, before becoming a full-time writer, you've worked so many jobs, right, in your life, among them including time in a laboratory, civil service, teaching, writing textbooks, obviously. Many young people these days feel as if they were stuck in their day job. It seems to them that they would rather be doing something more creative, like writing a music, or writing a book, or do photography. But they have to pay the bills, and the loans, and the mortgage, and the student loans. So what would your message to the young and not so young people who do not find passion in everyday job be? Um, again, it would every piece of advice would be targeted at an individual person. But broadly speaking, I do not encourage young writers to assume that being a full-time writer is the answer to everything. It generally isn't. I recommend people to have jobs, to uh, experience life, and then when they have built up a bank of experience, they can write. You can't write out of nothing, you know. The idea of, you know, finishing university and going, sitting in a room all day, every day, writing full time. It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense, you know. Now, it might seem strange coming from somebody who started the Irish Writers' Union, etc., etc., trying to uh, establish writing as a profession. What I feel is that writing should be adequately rewarded. You know, if you write a novel today, you know, if you get it published, you know, you might get 2,000 euro for it. If you're very lucky, you might get 5,000. These um, high profile people who get 100,000, they're as rare as hen's teeth. You know, there are only a few of them, okay? Um, so writing is not adequately rewarded. Now, you know, the cynic will answer like, oh yeah, like, but you take it to the marketplace, you sell it for what it's worth. That isn't true. That isn't true at all. This country owes a, an incredible amount of money to writers. Look at all the, the money that James Joyce brings into this country. James Joyce, whom this country, this government, our government, wouldn't repatriate his body when he died. He died in Zur Zurich. He's buried in Zurich, and at one stage his family made an approach to the government to see if they would bring back his body the same way as they had brought back William Butler Yeats. They wouldn't, okay? But now, James Joyce is major money ra raiser, so they celebrate Bloomsday and blah, blah, blah. So, the state is dependent on writers. But they have total contempt, you know, like when they talk about arts funding, they say, aren't we wonderful? We spend so much on funding the arts. You know, give me a rest. It's the arts that are funding the government, the arts that are keeping the country afloat. Don't give me this rubbish about how generous the state is in funding the arts. It isn't. Now, if people were, were rewarded for their work, they might be able to more easily become professional writers and full-time writers eventually, okay? 
But as a piece of advice, I say, look, you have to pay your bills, as you said. You have to pay your bills. You have to look at things in a sensible way. You also have to get experience. I would say that straight away to young people. Get experience. Um, and build up, look on it in two ways. This is the job you do in order to earn money. This is what you want to finance. So how much time do you have to spend at the job or a job in order to finance that? Work it out. It's just a balance sheet. And get it as well balanced as you possibly can. Right? And then uh, you can work your way towards spending more and more time uh, at your writing or music or whatever you're doing. You know? I think I absolutely love that answer. I would, I would vote for you. If you were to, to start a program, Arts Fund, Arts Fund State, I'd so vote for that. And I also feel that we are running out of time. We are slightly over the schedule. Um, I've, I've promised I'm going to take questions. Let's limit it to one, two questions. Does anyone have a burning desire? Please do ask. Hey, uh, you said you started the Irish Writers' Centre as a way of gathering the community together because it was quite fragmented. But even now today, it is still quite fragmented with the Writers' Centre and the Smoke Factory and Books Upstairs, New Theatre. They, they all have good support networks for new writers, but they don't seem to work together or, or create that network. Do you see that landscape changing at all? Or do you think that's just the way it's always going to be? Um, no, I think there's far more coordination than you imagine. Yeah, there are all these... Uh all these outlets now and that's great you know so like say for example open mic sessions they have one in the writer's end and they have one in wherever half a dozen around us that doesn't mean they're in competition that means there are just more options for writers which is great you know i don't think say when i went back to the um the center in 2009 there was a fairly poisonous atmosphere you know uh, and organizations hated each other. And one of the first things that I did was try to open up conversations with different organizations. And we established a kind of network of organizations. And we actually went in and made a presentation to, to, uh, to the Doyle and Shannon one time. Uh, and so it's not as fragmented as it would appear. Obviously, there will always be kind of groups and Maybe there'll be an opposition or they won't like each other. I don't think uh, it's quite as competitive. I think it's far more cooperative than appears. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. I think we will uh, limit that to one question, and I'm really sorry about that. I have a long list that I wanted to ask Jack, but I think we'll have to leave it for next time. Um, I'd like to close the session with a quick quote from the book uh, that we all have. And I challenge you to find an answer to the question that I'm going to pose in that book or in your life. So the main uh, character in the book, Zaya, teaches his pe people to achieve satisfaction in life, not happiness. Why not happiness, but satisfaction? That is the question I'm going to leave hanging out there. Because I think that our generation sometimes is overly all about happiness. Instagram is about happiness. Our meditation is about happiness. And I loved that question because I can relate to that. And I hope you can too. Thank you for today's session. Jack, thank you for coming. Okay.